trying to figure out how to play it, so don't show up. That was absolutely one of the things I was going to ask you today, was how is death building going? It's, it's a hard game, and there are people out there that are playing that? Woo! It's, yeah. Yeah. it's a difficult game, so my friend Andrew was like, you should, you know, I, I enjoy fantasy, I enjoy kind of deep dives into fantasy type yeah. of thing, obviously playing League of Legends with Billy. And I was like, if you like that level of immersion of fantasy, he was like, you should check out Magic the Gathering because it's a tabletop game, you can play with your friends, it's fun. So we played like a couple of games, but then I said, how long did it take for you to actually like fully learn it? And he was yeah. like, it was probably a year of playing. Mm. I was like, okay. <laughs> I can play for a year and, and not know what there is, and eventually figure it out. That X thing really freaks me out. Like a lot of the stuff I get, but then it's like, if X is this, then that means that X is that. I'm like, what is this X? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're making algebra. Like, I thought I was past this. I, I work at Wizards of the Coast. Like that's my oh, day job, um, uh, and I don't understand anything about magic. So <laughs> <laughs> very much the best. Confusing game for sure, but the artwork is just beautiful. Oh, it's incredible! And some of the like secret layer, like special sets and stuff yeah. are out yeah. of control. Very cool. There's people have been very sweet going. Here's, here's this one card that I really like, and you can have it. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. We gotta get you a black lotus. No, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> that's the one. Did Post Malone buy one for like almost a million dollars? I saw that. I mean, it's more money than sense that guy. <laughs> Or very good sense, depending yeah, on how collective you are. Yeah. Uh, so you are you are also a big gamer, uh, a video gamer. What are you playing right now? I mean, I'm playing a lot of League of Legends with Billy, which is super fun. Billy plays. If anyone out there does play League of Legends, and they know the character Heimerdinger, who's like a tiny little kind of professor that like is slightly confused. And like, that's who Billy plays, which is like, <laughs> fucking adorable. <laughs> Billy is cute anyway. <laughs> and then when he plays a game, he gets all flustered. He's like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, you are Heimerdinger. Kind of you can follow the professor. So, uh, playing playing um, League of Legends, I'm constantly playing FIFA because, you know, that's just kind of my game. I'm yet to play, but I am going to uh, download next week that game straight. About the oh, yeah. 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 I think yeah. it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think it's really beautiful. Not the longest game ever, right? No, 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 it's easy really play. A few hours, type thing. Yeah. And then the Miles Morales Spider-Man game, I just play it all the time because it's just so fun. I worked on that game. Oh, did you really? That's great. I was so glad to hear that. What I love about that game is it's, it, it leans into a little arcade vibe. Yes, you know? definitely. So the, the combat and the way that you move, there's a lot of combos that you can do. But to a certain extent, it's relatively easy to get those combos. Yeah, friendly neighborhood. For yeah, sure. so like your friends are watching, they're like, oh, you're really good at this game. And you're like, well, I'm sure it's going to be good. But I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> I am really good. I am <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. uh, you were recently in another game that I was a writer for, Call of Duty Vanguard. Did you, know, you play Vanguard in the crowd? Yeah, that was yeah. super fun. Uh, you played our villain, Richter. It was wonderful. What was it like getting into that kind of a really dastardly role? Yeah, that was, that was amazing. That was a really amazing experience. And I, and I said to the guys there that, like, if, uh, if there was another opportunity to do a video game, I would, I would love to do it. It's like doing a play, yeah. uh, because the guy said, we're not going to be doing different angles of the scene. We're just going to shoot the scene once, and all of these cameras in this room are going to cover the scene. And if we get it right once, that's it. We do not shoot it again. Wow. I was like, oh, so if the cast know what they're doing, we can wrap by like, one? <laughs> like, yeah, you get it right. And that's invariably what happened, you know? Um, but so fun, and you're using your entire body, and um, yeah, I played a real kind of, you know, paranoid, violent, German uh, Nazi officer. So, you know, very much playing to my, to my kind of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was fun. It was super fun. I love that. And you, or Bailey, was also in Vanguard. He's also in Critical Role. You've also Woo! been in Critical Role in Black Yeah, we have two of them. I love that show. So good. It was a pleasure to be a part of the Critical Role family. That's great. These guys are so funny and, and edgy, and I love their comedy, and um, obviously watched quite a few of the things that they did. And was playing Dungeons and Dragons actually during COVID lockdown. Oh. Yeah, and I think they might have got wind of that or something like that. And then they, I was just approached. They said we'd love to have you come in and, 
and play a voice. And I said, well, that'd be fantastic. But I said, if I do that, can I, can I do a voice that sounds nothing like me? So that there's a chance that maybe I can come back. Yeah. So I gotta talk like a kind of Scottish guy. <laughs> Which is like, well, I think Billy's gonna sound like when he's nine to five. <laughs> but I can't want him. Get me a cup of tea. <laughs> it was great. These guys were really fun to work with. And I love the, the animation style oh, of same. that. Slightly leaning towards an old fashioned style, like a drawing kind yeah. of style. But beautiful and funny and really fun, and hopefully I can come back and, and do it. That show just exploded, you know. When you were playing D D on your own during the pandemic, like yeah. what what was your character? I was a halfling. <laughs> 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 Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I was like that. I was like, basically a, a religious hobbit. Um, yeah. But scored a few like major um, what do you call it? Perfect twenties? Is that what do you call it? Uh, yeah, critical twenty. Yeah, critical yeah, critical, 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 critical hit. Um, in situations where my team were like, oh, we don't really know what to do here, we're kind of backing ourselves into a corner. And I'm like, oh, well, let me roll a dice and see. And I'm roll a twenty. You'd be like, oh, I guess I just saved all you guys. That's <laughs> 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 totally welcome. That's so, the beautiful thing about D and D. Love it. It's great. It's so I'm trying to get Billy to play. Billy's really interested in it, but he doesn't quite understand it, and I'm trying to explain to him. But we're trying. To uh, I'm trying to get him to play the space kind of based version. Space Jammer? What is that called? Space Jammer. Spelljammer? Spelljammer? Yeah. Is that right? Because uh, I think Billy's all time favorite role in the space Jammer. Spelljammer? Yeah. Spelljammer? Yeah. Because I think Billy's all time favorite role, if you could pick it, would be the Cats with the Special. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it's his birthday tomorrow. You guys know that, right? Yeah. yeah. So, anyone who's coming to the panel tonight, we're obviously going to sing Happy Birthday to Billy. But he's been, he's been making like a real big fuss out of the fact that we're supposed to like, you know, spoil him and stuff. So we bought dinner last night and, uh, you know, we bought some gifts. But he's making a big deal out of like, you know, this is my birthday, this is my birthday. We're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> If you've seen it any point today, like, make a big deal out of it. He only got you guys pencils, you don't have to go all out. Yeah, he got his pencils. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. yeah. Amazing. Well, we, we're going to take audience questions. We have a mic runner in the room right over here. So if you have a question, throw your hand up. And uh, our lovely volunteer, what's your name from? Um, Beatrice. Beatrice is going to run you the mic. Hi. 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 Um, first of all, a uh, big fan of Pro Critical World 2. I love you play Archibald. It, it's a thing. It's amazing. But I also want to talk about um, another show that you did that my whole family enjoys, uh, Wild Things. Um, one, are you thinking of doing another of the season? And two, are there any times that you've done the show that you said, oh crap, call my mom, I'm about to die? <laughs> yeah, we did get in trouble a few times during Wild Things. I got like a big scar on my arm from getting bitten by a lizard oh, wow. in Thailand. Uh, almost like broke uh, through a few veins, which was kind of fun. So that was a time where I called my mom and I was like, oh, well, I used to keep lizards as a kid, you know, so my mom's fine with lizards. So I called my mom and I was like, hey, I'm in Thailand, I'm in the hospital. She was like, oh, and I said I've been bitten by a lizard. She was like, oh, like thinking, a lizard, you know. <laughs> How big was that lizard? I was like, it's about 11 feet. She was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been bitten by a monster lizard. Like, yeah, kind of. Um, like a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. um, we got chased by an elephant, which was really kind of crazy, and my cameraman Frank, who actually comes from here, almost was, was killed by it. We actually made wild things out of Toronto, so the, yeah, the production of his cream is in Toronto. Um, so I was here, I don't know, eight, ten times over like two or three years to break stories for that show. Um, we're developing, with Cream, the same company that I made Wild Things with, we're developing a, a, an underwater kind of Ooh. show, Ooh. nature Ooh. show. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about that, or certainly challenging, is like to get the equipment under the water is a lot. Yeah. And in the time that it takes for you to like figure out where we're going to go and the animals and the guides and the stories that we're going to tell, the equipment kind of phases out. Right. So then you need to retrain yourself with your equipment. So you, you think, oh, I'm going to go into the water with this camera. But two years later, after you then mm -hmm. about ready to make the show, that camera's gone. You need to go train yourself with a new camera. So we're in the process of like figuring it out. But I will do more nature stuff. I tried to get, um, got an opportunity to go diving with sharks years ago. Um, like free diving with, with big great whites and stuff, and I invited Billy, and I thought that he would come. He was like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Swimming in the ocean with big great whites? I was like, yeah. It's, it's like a once in a lifetime opportunity. He was like, yeah. yeah. They will eat us. <laughs> 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 
know. Uh, so yeah, well, I'll leave home. Hey, having been to Toronto so many times, uh, do, have you found some favorite spots? Like, did you take the guys out last night somewhere you like? Or? I went to a place called Aloe last night. Oh. Like, yeah, the junction of like Queen and Spadina. Um, right. It's nice. It was a long meal. We got there at nine. I don't think we left the restaurant until midnight. Ah, the best. Yeah, it was a long meal. Great. Um, I like the Indian food here. It's really great Indian food here in Toronto. I'll see good coffee. Everyone's very friendly, very kind. And uh, yeah, it's just kind of a, a groovy city. Nice, yeah. nice. I love it. Yeah. All right, where's our where's Beatrice here? Oh hi. Hey, uh, I know you just got to Magic, and I hope you're ready in a couple of years. There's Lord of the Rings set coming out. Yes. Yeah, you're probably signing a lot of Lord of the Rings cards. I was wondering, uh, since you started the game, what's your favorite color and, and will, do you think those colors represent the magic card that they're going to create for you, for your character? I, I, yeah, I, I mean, they're all kind of fun colors and, and, and worlds and stuff. I think I'm probably more drawn to obviously the green stuff because I'm a nature obsessive. Maybe the blue as well. So there's a name for like a splicing in between the blue and the. Cermak. Cermak. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what she said. Um, we both think that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were testing you. I like them. I like those cards. Um, I like kind of, you know, shrines seem really interesting to me. I seem to be kind of drawn to them. And yeah, I know about the Lord of the Rings uh, kind of set. And I was talking to a friend of mine who plays magic and saying, what do we think is going to be the powerful card? And he was like, I, I was saying, I'm sure Balrog and Gandalf and Aragorn are going to be powerful. Sauron, of course. And then he said that the ring will probably be a hugely powerful card as well, because mm -hmm. obviously it can be good and bad and change certain things. So that's going to be fun when it comes out. Just the design, the whole design of that, that game, the, the artwork is stunning. They work with great artists. They really do. Yeah. It's intricate. It's beautiful. Cool. Yeah, man. Thanks. Okay. Where's the interest now? Nice to meet you. Thanks. Hello. 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 <laughs> Hi. Um, so I know you've said several times that you don't like watching movies that you've played in because you're too critical and you've lived in the moment, which I totally understand and respect because I don't like watching myself on film either. Um, so my question is, do you ever watch the behind the scenes that like we were remembering or do you just like, get a laugh out of it? Or? Yeah, I have. And, and just to clarify on that on that question, because I have, I have answered that a few times, I mean, I think it's like, like I so said, I think most people, like if you would, if, if, whatever, if you're at a wedding and there's a whole bunch of people giving speeches or dancing or whatever, and you're one of those people. You, you, you might give it like a glance to make sure that you didn't look silly or stupid, but pretty quickly you're like, I don't need to see it anymore. Like, you don't, I don't see any real reason in like watching something that you've done over and over again, apart from some level of ego, which I'm not really connected to as much anymore because I've worked a lot on that stuff. But, I was asked recently about Lost, someone was like, what's the beginning of Lost? And I said, well, I didn't see it. And they said, you didn't see it? And I said, no, I, I didn't see it. This is, and, and then it came out, Don Monaghan never saw <laughs> the TV show Lost. It's, it's not true. I, was, I saw all of season one. I saw a little bit of season two. But Lost, when it was on the TV, played Wednesday nights at seven. By the time we got to season two, we were doing an extraordinary amount of night shoots because that's just where the story had gone of the it's happening at night, you know, we're all like camping on the, you know, firelight and stuff. So we would be shooting a lot on a Wednesday night at seven o'clock. So I personally missed, I don't know, six, seven episodes in a row. And by the time I tuned in again, I was like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. <laughs> <laughs> What's that person? <laughs> like that kind of thing. And then I just stopped. And then I was busy working. So, and, and again, with the whole thing of like, why am I watching it? There's no basis in. in value for me to watch it. But like I said, it came out like, whatever, Dom has never seen Lost. It's not true. I just said, I haven't seen the finale, and I, I don't have any comments about whether it's good or bad, because it's really none of my business. Behind the scenes stuff and wild things, I'll probably watch a little bit more, because that's just me, do you know what I mean? That's, I'm, a, I'm a little bit okay, yeah. or, or, or a little bit more comfortable watching myself. If I'm playing a, a, a role or a character, I don't know, I, I, it's like, if, if I have a great day at work where I'm like, wow, we really smashed that scene and I'm delighted, I'm probably 60% happy with my work. And that's good. I'm like, great, I'm going to have to C+. Great, I'm stoked. <laughs> if I watch it, it's immediately a D. Because I'm just like, oh, 
they chose that take, or they chose that angle, or I should have done that, or well, there's a different option there. I should. And you can, it's art, it's never finished, it's never, you know, you can never, like, when do you know when to hang a painting type thing? You know, sooner or later the artist has to just go, okay, it's done. But you know, you can put an extra brush stroke on there, so it, it, it's all wrapped up in that thing. It's a very long answer to your question, but um, <laughs> I have watched some behind the scenes stuff. I like watching when, it, you know, whatever, when, when Billy and I do not you know, during Lord of the Rings outtakes, that's kind of funny. Obviously, I've seen Hans Jensen a couple of times. But it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of Lost, you have another TV show on the air right now, Moonhaven. Oh, yeah. I see you have some Moonhaven fans. Yeah. Hey, you know, um, check it out, AMC Plus. Um, it's doing really well. We're going to go back to do a second season, I don't know, probably February or March of next year in Dublin. Ooh. It's fun. That's exciting. What do you like about shooting on Moonhaven? Well, Dublin's a really beautiful part of the world, and the, and the cast and crew are lovely. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of like the. Um, there's a real self-contained element to Moonhaven because obviously it's you know it's about a community of people living on the moon where a murder takes place, and they have to kind of you know work work it all out. So the, the kind of self-contained element is, is kind of uh, interesting to me. The scripts are great. Cast are lovely. I play a very open, naive, kind of emotional, heartfelt character. So just making decisions based on his heart. He truly believes that all humans are good and all humans will do the right thing, yeah. which obviously, as we know, is not always the case. Um, so yeah, it's a really fun show. You guys should totally check it out. It's very like Agatha Christie in space yeah. kind of vibes, which is cool. I was wondering, you, you work with Joe Magnello yeah. on that show, and he is a big D&D &D dude. Right. And, magic. And, magic. and magic. I was wondering if you guys have like, made plans to play together. We did talk about Magic the last time I saw him, and he was like, we'll bring your stuff and we'll play in Dublin, so we'll get a chance to do that then. But, um, Love that. Yeah, there's, I used to do a lot of work with Kadeem Hudson, and, and someone was writing saying, this is the body cop sci-fi partnership <laughs> in space that we never knew that we needed in yeah. terms of. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> really good. Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah, it's a fun show. Band in the air. Band in the air. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I was actually going to ask a little bit about being painted, but you can just answer that. Oh, hi! How are you? <laughs> um, but, okay, so how about this? I really love Wild Things, and I really love the friendship on you. That's fantastic. Um, out of all of your characters that aren't just you on the screen, which one do you identify with most? Because Paul is so lovable and so endearing, and, and he's probably closest. I would think that you're too, not the naive part at all, but just the, the you're, you come across that way on French Onion and things like that. So what do you think that you identify with most? I used to use the most like me of any, any character that I've played. I mean, I think you, I think you put a little bit of, of you in everything. Um, maybe not now, not the 45-year-old Dom, but I think maybe the 20, Seven-year-old Don was probably the closest to Charlie from Lost than anyone ever played. I was, I was pretty close to that guy, you know. I was very deep into music. Mm -hmm. I was, um, you know, very deep into music, very artistically inclined. Um, you know, obviously had my journey as an English person growing up in and around pubs and <laughs> alcohol and drugs, and you know, knew what that journey was about. Um, and I think the kind of that interesting element which we explored with JJ very quickly of like this is a guy who had a glimpse of notoriety and fame with his band Drabshare and his song and then disappeared onto a, onto a deserted island and I think I kind of meditated throughout that time on like that we could be telling the story of me here you know I'm good about the briefest glimpse of notoriety having been involved in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and then just kind of disappear into, you know, the ether with a TV show that didn't become a hit, or other projects that didn't really do anything. So, certainly season one and season two of Lost, I was like, man, this is blurring the lines of, like, me and the characters. So, yeah, probably mm -hmm. Charlie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's really awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Um, sorry, I thought I was supposed to choose, but I, I guess, I think you should, you guys should choose who's going to ask the question, and I just pass it. Oh! Oh, yeah, I can do oh. that. If you want, you want me to do that. Yeah, why don't you do it? Yeah, I'll do okay. it. Oh, wow. It's easier for me to hurt feelings yeah, than yeah. you. I got you. All right, over here in the, with the black wig. Lovely outfit. Lovely. Thank you. 
Okay, so two things real quick. One, you should definitely build an Ur dragon deck because there's something just really fun about having about 17 to 30 dragons on the field and having everyone else going, God, I don't need a board boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun, isn't it? Dragons. Cool. It's a good time. Um, two. So going back to Lord of the Rings, I know that there was just a lot of just incidents and just different chaotic things and stuff. What's the most chaotic thing that you were part of at Lord of the Rings? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, a lot. Really. It was a lot. It was a long time shooting that film. Vigo and I got into a kind of a backwards and forwards thing where the production had to like eventually step in and say, you guys have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Which just started in a, well, it was always light-eyed and fun, because, you know, Vigo and I are pals, but like, we, we just started wrecking each other's trailers, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think, I don't know, I, I, I think what happened was, I came back into my trailer one time, and as a big Manchester United fan, he had put a whole bunch of Liverpool and Arsenal. <laughs> 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 And then I found out it was Vigo, so then I took all of his furniture out of his <laughs> and just left it on the side. Which, the thing is, I think what happened was the production were like, that's funny, great, but Vigo doesn't have to put his furniture back on. We do. He <laughs> just, just messes with us now. So then, I think Vigo, like, turned all the taps on in my trailer and then got flooded. <laughs> and then we did the toilet paper around the outside of Vigo's trailer. Um, and, uh, it, it culminated in me putting a whole trout in, um, a, a dead trout, in, uh, in Sean Bean's, uh, the, the, the bonnet, like the hood of his car. Like, I thought it was Vigo's car. There was a chance that it was going to be Vigo's car. Because we would always swap cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had one down in a place, and then when we go back to the production office, I was like, who gets it next? And they were like, well, it depends on who's coming in. It's either going to be Sean Vigo or Vigo. And I was like, oh, Vigo, you say? <laughs> <laughs> Ran off to the fishmongers and got a massive trout. It was like this big. And put it in the, up underneath the hood of his car. So it was like, rotted on the course of that. And at that point, the coach was like, okay, please stop. <laughs> and we stopped. Some poor intern picking fish bars. <laughs> in the back. Uh, yes. Hello, darling. Wow, that's really good. Are, are you, is anyone coming to the Friendship Onion tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> Still tickets on sale. We're going to be doing some local Toronto um, delicacy and um, talking about what it feels like to be here. So if there's any like Canadians, we will be talking about Canadians. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dominic. Hi. Um, I know this is a little different, but uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get tickets to be with you guys tonight because I already spent enough money just to be here alone. So I was wondering, um, when, if you end up seeing your your fellow hobbits beforehand, can you maybe say hi to them for me? Yeah, for sure. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> What's your name? Jordan. 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 All right, we'll remember. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Thanks, Jordan. All right, let's go over there. That way. I'm, I'm making Beatrice put the work in today. Yeah, I'm really, she's jogging. She's doing great. Hi. Uh, hey. I just wanted to know, now that it's been almost 20 years since uh, Return of the King, how are you coping with that? <laughs> Seems the further you get away from those movies, the bigger 
they are becoming in a way. It's really yeah. Weird. Like, yeah. It came out, and people were obviously like, hey, it's a great film, you should go, you guys should go and see it. But then very quickly it became like, this is a little bit of a classic, and then it became an award-winning classic, and then it became like this sacred kind of moment in movies. And I think maybe with Rings of Power coming out, there's been this reintroduction to like, okay, Rings of Power's coming out, let's revisit the Jackson trilogy, and people are yeah. like, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, the standard that it should be kept to type thing. So it's it's growing in its um in its kind of pattern. I agree. It feels like the story of how you guys made it too is really legendary in and of itself. Like that has kind of taken on a mythology of its own, like outside of the movies. Just the experience of making the movies is such a big deal, which is pretty cool. Yeah. It's funny, I think I've told the story before, but if you obviously four hobbits went to the Oscars for Return of the King, never been before, never been since. And um, the day before, I painted like the nail beds of my left hand in black. So it looked like black Sharpie in my nail bed. So I was just like, oh, that's kind of cool. And um, <laughs> JJ Abrams saw that on the telecast for the Oscars. And when I saw it later on, like a couple of days later, for another conversation about Lost, he was like, hey, I like your nails, you should keep those for Charlie. And we kept those for Charlie. But that was me going to the Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm just going to do something with my nails. And then it kind of popped. And it ended up being a Charlie Pace thing. So it's like the weird, blurry line thing that I was talking about was consistently happening. I was a little baby. Baby. Put the gauntlet up here. This is, this is a good look. Lady Ewan. Oh, yes, amazing. <laughs>
Chinese Juliet. Um, there was a picture that was floating around the internet where um, you, Elijah, Sean, and Dom, or Dominic, were at a diner. You were at a diner, and you took a picture of the four of you, and then um, the couple behind you or beside you were such huge fans, and the, I think the gentleman photobombed your photo. Yeah, yeah, Colorado, I think. But yeah, cool. Uh, I was just wondering, when you saw that picture, what, what were you thinking, and what was the funniest photo bomb you've ever done? Uh, I, I mean, I had, to, I had to stop it, because um, before Lord of the Rings kind of smashed, I was obviously spending a lot of time with Elijah for that year after we'd shot the film, before it came out, and, and Elijah at that point in the United States was a relatively well-known actor, so people were coming over to him to get photos, and I would always pull ridiculous faces. <laughs> and Elijah actually said to me, you know, sooner or later you probably have to stop that because there's gonna be like hundreds of photos of you just looking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, I did stop that. Um, I'll still pull some funny faces. I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen, we've been going out for dinner every time that we've done these conventions. And I think every single one of those photos is me going, <laughs> I'm not just like sat with my pals and I'm like, oh my god, I didn't believe really what's happening. <laughs> um, yeah, that was fun. That, that photo, obviously, we, we were not aware that he was photo bombing. Not that we cared one way or the other. It made the photo really kind of cute and funny and, and, and fun for all of us. But what I didn't realize in that photo, which I thought was really beautiful and just kind of random, was we're all sat in the exact same configuration that we are at the end of the movie mm -hmm. at the Prince of Pony. So I'm sat next to Elijah and Billy sat next to Sean and they, someone showed up a mirror image of that thing and they're like, look, 20 years later, these guys are just still sat in that position. So I thought that was kind of rad, you know? Um, yeah. That's really cute. Yeah, yeah. That's really cute. It's I cute. love that. Uh, let's, go, let's go over here. We got some of the big tattoo on the arm in the back. Hi. Hey, how's it going? What's up, man? Uh, I was just wondering, what was your experience working with like Christopher Lloyd and uh, Sir Ian hey. McKellen? Miss Lloyd? No. Hey. 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 Christopher Lloyd. Get out. You're good, you're good, man. <laughs> yeah, Christopher Lee was a, a, an incredibly impressive uh, human being in a lot of different ways. I actually was with him his first day of filming. So yeah, I got a, I got a phone call saying, hey, you're gonna be picked up a little bit earlier because we're, we're uh, picking up Christopher Lee and coming in at the same time. I was like, okay. Um, so I think I got picked up around about five. And Christopher Lee was already in the car. So I think he had probably been picked up at 4.30 at the latest. And I just, I'd, I'd met him before. We'd been in rehearsals together and all that kind of stuff. And I was in the back, he's in the front. Very big, imposing man, Christopher Lee. You know, six, four, six, five type. And I just kind of said, um, good morning. How's it going? Just to let you know that I was there in case, uh, you know, whatever. And he turned around, good morning, Dominic. <laughs> and he said, I have never been picked up this early in my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll just sit in the back and not <laughs> Clearly, not super happy about that. But he loved Lord Rings, and he knew a lot about it. Sat around at lunch one time with him, telling us stories about Errol Flynn and oh, wow. Marlon Brando and Marilyn Monroe and you know, Diana Dawes. And I was just like, oh, keep going, keep going. going. <laughs> that was fun. And I think the best thing I ever saw with Elijah at this point, if, if I hadn't been with Elijah and I'd told this story, people would not believe me because I do, I do like the occasional kind of tall story here. And, um, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But um, Elijah and I were sat with Christopher Lee one time, we were on location, and he went, uh, I want to show you something. <laughs> and like, oh, God. And I was expecting it to be like a weird, weird birthmark. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he had a pen, he was making notes on the script with a pen, like a big pen. And he just threw this big pen at the tree, which is about where that pillar is, and it stuck in the tree like a <laughs> And we were just like, oh, wow, that's amazing, Chris Bailey, like, went off and, and then obviously we found out later that obviously, you know, he was a pretty high-ranking officer in the army and behind enemy lines in 
in Germany and Ian Fleming had based James Bond on Christopher Lee, you know, so you're like, and at, at one point that was probably not a pen. <laughs> that was probably not a tree. <laughs> Actually, know the sound of what it would be when a man is being stabbed in the throat. Sounds good. Also, like a really accomplished musician as well, brought out like heavy metal albums and stuff like that. Just like a fascinating human being. Yeah, lovely guy. Lovely guy. Uh, on the end uh, over here. Hi. Yeah. Once again, making Beatrice really, really work for her volunteer bucks today. So. <laughs> yeah, round of applause for Beatrice. Right there. That's all good. Okay, so I think for all of us, it was like pretty tragic to see Charlie die. Um, sorry, I lost the <laughs> uh, Just curious, how was it on your end? How did you learn? How did it feel? Yeah, it was good, man. I mean, you know, I kind of. I realized that I was, I was probably only going to get one great crack of the whip to exit that show and, you know, probably leaving in the last episode of the finale like a lot of characters did is going to be diluting, you know, your personal story because you're going to end your story in the same time that, you know, 15 other characters did. So for, you know, Charlie's story to end in season three was was amazing, the storyline was great. You know, it was kind of bittersweet in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, it was a lurch in, in the same way that it probably was for Charlie. I mean, you know, David said about a third of the way through season three, I think we found a really great way to write for Charlie this season. And I said, great. And he said, it's probably gonna end with you exiting the show. And I said, okay, I mean, you know, I'd rather that than just kind of fade into the background and not affect change, you know, so. It was cool. I love water. I've always had a really great relationship with water. You know, I like surf, I scuba dive, I swim. I, I really enjoy being around water and it's always been very kind to me. So I was not in any way kind of overawed by doing water scenes and I enjoy being under the water, you know. Um, I don't know. Ch Charlie's kind of, you know, Charlie's kind of all over the place in that show. He's good, he's bad, he's on drugs, he's not on drugs, he's with the baby, he's with Claire, he's doing this, he's hectic. And that's great, that's a huge part of his personality, but what I really liked coming to the very end is you do see a kind of focus with Charlie. He's like, okay, this is my moment, you know? Because a lot of people say to me, why don't you just swim out the back? You know, there's an explosion that opens the, the hatch chamber thing. Why don't you just swim out the back of the chamber? But it's a choice, Charlie's doing it as a choice. Of course he knows he can swim, but he's been told by Desmond, if you if you don't die, then it's going to affect, you know, other people on the island, Claire and the baby. But if you do die, you're probably going to help them, you know. So he looks around at that moment and he's like, oh, this is the moment. And I like the fact that in those final little moments with Charlie, he does kind of calm down and, you know, become like a man of sorts. Um, and I've had a lot of people over the years do the not Penny's boat thing, which is kind of fun. I honestly think Not Penny's Boat is like one of the most iconic moments in television history. Yeah. Like I, I feel pretty strongly about that. Yeah, and when they when they do like saddest deaths on TV, it's usually in the top three. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I'm just glad that it made you know made a difference in that show. Yeah. Okay, let's go up here. Hi, in the back. Yeah. Uh, well, we can do both hats. Why not? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, so obviously you spent a lot of time with Billy on and offset. So I was just wondering what's your favorite memory with him on or offset? I mean, probably, probably the ones offset of, of moving into like, you know, legal issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, he, you know, Pippin finding Mary on the battlefield is a really amazing moment because they've almost like switched roles, you know, for a, a, for a long time there. And whether it was like on purpose, 
you know, maybe if you just went along with it, I think Mary kind of felt like, well, I'm, I'm the sensible one, I'm the one that will take care of you, I'm the one that will keep you out of the scrapes, and people's like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Whereas at the end of the third movie, obviously, Mary's in a real mess, and Pippin's like the grown up who like, comes to like, take him away and keep him safe. So I think that's like a, that was a really beautiful moment for Billy and I, after years of having worked on these characters together, to realize that they, they'd actually, you know, switch roles and, and come full circle. So that was memorable. And then Offset, uh, it's just like the little things with friends, right? Like, I mean, you know, obviously I work with Billy every week when we do the French Coding podcast, but like I spent quite a few weekends just hanging out with him, you know, during COVID, when we got to a point where, we, you know, I could, we could actually see people, Billy and his family became those people that I saw. So after like, I don't know, seven to eight months of not seeing anyone that I knew, apart from like video calls and stuff, you know, to like knock on his door and, you know, give my mate like, a hug and see his wife and see his kids was, was a really beautiful moment. And they knew how, certainly at that point in, in all of our health, they knew how potentially vulnerable that was making them because no one was seeing anyone at that point. But we were allowed to see like little bubbles if you wanted. And Billy was like, well, come down and see us then. If you, if you, you know, because he was obviously spending time with his wife and son. So he was like, I'm going to school with me. We don't, we don't have COVID. Um, but if you need to see a human being, do that. So I think it, it's those little things. Also, last night we went to dinner for his birthday and Billy showed up a little tipsy. <laughs> <laughs> and we proceeded to get him drunk. <laughs> and that's one of my favorite versions of Billy. Because when, when Billy is uh, drunk and other people aren't drunk, he gets like a little. <laughs> Naughty, he wants to go like play with you and like get into you like that. So, I mean, you asked Elijah and Sean, last night Billy was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed at the table for like an extra hour just because Billy was in this like feisty little mood. Like, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about that tonight. Right? Yeah, We're going to go tonight for sure. Absolutely. Uh, yes, hi, we're here in the hat. Um. So I know when you're like shooting stuff in different time zones, it can, like the jet lag can be pretty tough. Do you have a secret to dealing with that, or do you just like awkwardly push through? The, the only time that it's like really, really has been really tough was was during Wild Things, because on Wild Things, you know, we would fly to a country, be there for like ten days, and not have any time to do anything. So you would land, sleep, sometimes not sleep, but land, sleep, wait for the next day, and work, and work with really dangerous animals that can kill you. So. That was a point where, you know, I was like, I really need to sleep on a plane. And I read this thing about a, a Formula One crew and, and a drive team. I don't really like Formula One, but I was just reading this article and I was like, I don't really know what I said, I don't really like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit mean, but um, yeah, this is not my favorite sport. I'll do it again. Um, anyway, um, they said, the crew said, because they have to obviously like, you know, pick up their entire car and team and whatever, and go to another part of the world and then drive, you know, the next day and work the next day. They said that they don't eat on the plane at all. They just drink water, no food, uh, because it's the digestive system that stays away or, 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 you know, falls asleep and stuff. And then they get on the, the time of the country that they're in as quickly as possible. So if they land and it's breakfast time, then they eat breakfast in that place. And if they land and it's dinner time, they eat dinner in that place. And I've tried that a couple of times, and that seemed to be um, effective. But I also don't produce a normal amount of melatonin, which is, is, is it an amino acid melatonin or a peptide or something like that, that makes you fall asleep, makes you feel tired. I don't produce the normal amount of it, which is fine. It just means I very rarely am tired. So the only times where I am tired is when I get jet lag. And it's actually a unique experience for me, for, be, for me to be like, Oh, I'm kind of tired, I need to go to bed, you know, so I sometimes kind of dig it. <laughs> That's a great tip. Is there any uh, any last words for our friends here in Toronto you want to share? Well, I just wanted to see you guys, obviously. Um, there are still tickets available for the Friendship Hunting podcast that Billy and I are doing tomorrow. Like I said, we're going to be doing all local talks about uh, Toronto and eat some sort of Toronto food, I would think. Um, and we're doing the panel tonight. If, if I didn't get a chance to answer your question, then you're going to come over and, and have me sign something, or you just want to come and say hello, you know, obviously come ask me whatever you want then. And um, we'll do photos and all that kind of stuff too. So. We appreciate you being here so much. Thank, Thank you. you.